Nassim Nicholas Taleb has devoted his life to immersing himself in problems of luck, randomness, human error, probability, and the philosophy of knowledge. Although born in Lebanon and with a rich family history in that country, in a 2008 London Times article, he was described as not believing in national character, those are the reporter's words, but to be comfortable with a regional identity. My body and soul are Mediterranean, he was quoted as saying. Mr. Professor Taleb, who has his bachelor's and master's in science from the, uni pardon me, from the University of Paris, an MBA from the Wharton School, and a PhD in management science from the University of Paris, also has had three successful careers thus far, as a man of letters, as a businessman, trader, and risk manager, and as a university professor. He is currently Distinguished Professor of Risk Engineering at New York University's Polytechnic Institute, a Distinguished Research Scholar at Oxford, and a Principal and Senior Scientific Advisor at Universa Investments. His books, Fooled by Randomness and The Black Swan, have been published in 31 languages, he is widely recognized as the foremost thinker on probability and uncertainty. Please welcome Nassim Nicholas Taleb. And uh, the idea of robustness um, can be best illustrated with this uh, example. How many of you own a, uh, what do you call them, these ugly things that sold by Amazon, where you can download electronic uh, Kindle? Okay. How many of you own a Kindle? Okay, all right, so, uh, and how many of you have read, have used the book, something commonly known as a book, you could buy it at a bookstore, like their bookstore. Okay, so a lot of you have read books, have seen books, touched the book, okay. Now make a comparison. If you spill coffee on your Kindle, you know what happens, no? Or if you don't have electricity, or if you're, in a, whatever, there's a technical problem. Now what kind of technical problem can you have with a book? All right, so, uh, so, okay, I have, uh, my parents had in their collection a book by Plotus, comedies by Plotus, uh, that my father bought for something like $5 in, in Moscow, and whatever, when he was visiting 50 years ago. Anyway, the book was 500 years old. It looked no different from a regular book. I don't know how many of you are old enough to have uh, encountered the, disk, the floppy disk drive Okay, all right, so I have stuff written on floppy disk drive not long ago, 10 years ago. I can't retrieve it, can't read them. I'm glad I can't read them because I'm sure I'd be very disappointed by the literary quality of what I wrote 10 years ago. But so you understand the difference between uh, the two worlds. One seemingly is not efficient, a book is heavy, it's so passe, all right. The other is hip, it's technology. And guess what? So the, uh, the problem with technology is that it seemingly optimizes things, but it does cause some fragility. And my idea is anything that becomes complex becomes a lot more fragile to black swans, to these events named you know, black swan after some exception mentioned by Juvenal. And my black swan is different because I'm not talking about birds, I'm talking about events with some sets, uh, some characteristics. So this, in a nutshell, is what I've been thinking about. Then I realized that anything fragile will eventually break, and anything robust will survive. And I looked at nature and discovered that nature had some parameters. Uh, no too big animals are too big. The elephant is the biggest. Why? Because as elephants, Anything bigger than an elephant would have to pay up for water per liter a lot more. You see, an elephant pays, pays up if there's a shortage of water, what do you pay up a lot more than a mouse per liter, you agree? So seemingly a large organization would be a lot more efficient, but in fact becomes a lot more fragile. So the biologists understand why, uh, you know, they have some theories of why you can't be bigger than an elephant is bullshit. I mean, the, the, the problem is sensitivity to uh, random events. Random events may squeeze you a lot more when you're a larger organism. So Mother Nature understands that rather well and builds things in a certain way. Humans think they're smart. <laughs> they build things in a bad way. 
and these things break. I mean, how many corporations have survived the last 100 years, 50 years, 25 years, 10 years? Right? So you realize that there's a high mortality in uh, uh, the species called businesses and a much higher mortality than in species, biological species. So based on that, I realized that we have to work on, I'm tired of the idea of the black swan, so we have to work on, on uh, something called robustness. And uh, in, uh, in this new uh, ver uh, edition of the black swan, <laughs> I made a tableau of where is it that we're fragile to black swans. I call that the fourth quadrant, and how we can protect ourselves by becoming more robust in the fourth quadrant. You can either exit the fourth quadrant, or if you're in it, you need to be robust. So I can talk about these things. Um, the 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 these idea of fragility and robustness came to me uh, as you know I, I'm not a, a Gladwell or a regular uh, journalist who takes a topic and milks it and then moves on. It's like serial monogamous to another topic. All right, I have I have only one topic. <laughs> Uncertainty, but I continue. So I continue. So the transition between my books is seamless. Okay, so uh, I'm transiting into how to live in a world we don't understand. So I added that stub uh, on fragility and robustness as a transition between the black swan and, and the, the next idea. Then I realized that you know that stub was rich enough as a document, it could be a book on its own. In, in Europe, in most countries, what I added to the black swan, we published a separate book. So that idea came to me before you know, I finished the black swan. I don't know how many of you remember or were old enough to remember the 2003 uh, problem we had in New York City when we had uh, a, sorry, a blackout. You remember the blackout? Okay, I don't know if you've seen pictures of Grand Central, but uh, I don't go to the movies anymore for reasons. And I uh, watched, uh, I remember, it reminds me of seeing a train station in Dr. Zhivago, people sleeping on the floor. You don't know if they're dead, you walk over bodies, you know, in Grand Central, New York, that was 2003. 2002, no, 2003. Grand Central 2003, New York City so vulnerable to a technological glitch and, and became an obsession for me. And I remember, you know, my, and, and you can, I couldn't wash my hands because they had that uh, fancy technology, no more faucets, it's so much passé. And it works beautifully, you know, you, 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 uh, you wave in front of it. Sometimes it doesn't work, of course, but here you couldn't wash your hands. You couldn't get water because they were 100% reliant on technology. So I understood what the notion of fragility was. And I knew that the idea of black swan had to be coupled with what systems are more fragile to black swan than others. So I continued my idea with that stub, and I'm continuing now. And, and uh, here I have my aphorisms. I even continue now part-time putting aphorisms on Twitter and because it's a good discipline to write ideas, uh, you know, in, in 140 characters. And now I'm trying to go to 100 characters, and maybe I'll get to 10 characters maybe one day. So, so this is my, my, my speech, all right? I think I'm done. It was a long minute. And now we can move to Q&A. And don't worry, I always, I sometimes don't listen to questions. So answers will be decorrelated. I can continue my speech, all right? <laughs> so don't, don't worry. Too. And, but you won't notice. This one thing I learned during my book tour uh, of 2007 when the Black Swan became a bestseller, I realized that when a journalist asks you a question and you listen to it, you feel obligated, and usually they're dumb questions by journalists. You, you, you have to answer, like CNBC journalist, you have to answer, all right? So if you listen to it. The best thing is I daydream when they ask me the question. I look at their face, I vaguely have an idea of what they're talking about, and I answer randomly, and it works beautifully. <laughs> Nobody notices. These are the viewers. I did that last week with CNBC. Perfect. Don't listen to what they're talking about, except very vaguely. So I realized that when people are focusing on your answers, the question doesn't matter much. And, and better have the illusion of, of having driven the conversation rather than me. It's a lot more fun. So I'd rather go to that format where you ask me questions, and we have time till they throw us out of here, and and we can I can answer. And plus, I have some aphorisms. If I don't have enough answers, I may read some aphorism or two <laughs> to just uh, you know uh, impress you guys with my literary uh, orientation. Okay, 
So uh, let's start with, uh, with Q&A. Oh, okay. He's asking me, about, I was accused of, uh, it's too cute to say that Black Swan author had a hand <laughs> in, <laughs> in the destruction of markets, the flash crash, and perhaps destruction of Western civilization, a lot of things. And I was sipping wine. I was in Saudi Arabia and got to Dubai, and I developed an obsession for Lebanese wine. And someone provided me with Lebanese wine. I was sipping Lebanese wine in Dubai, and I couldn't care less about what was happening in markets. Of course, we, you get phone calls. If you are in a market, if you're involved with a hedge fund, and that's, the hedge fund is a baby of my old hedge fund. It's not a real hedge fund. It's a firm that just buys out-of-money options. Because I have this idea that the only way you can understand the world is if you have something at risk. Plus, life is very boring if when you wake up in the morning, you don't have a screen to go to, all right? <laughs> so, uh, to, to look at what happens, all right? So, and, and, uh, so it's good to be involved in something. But I, I'm, I'm involved, but I don't have enough interest in details of transactions. So, I'm, I'm completely immune from, from burdens of details of transactions. I have no idea what they traded. But I know that we're in a business of buying puts almost every day, okay? Just like you're in a trucking business, so you have trucks, you know, on a road every day, right? Now, if one of your trucks is on the bridge, the last truck on the bridge before the bridge collapses, you're definitely, only the Wall Street Journal would be interested in investigating why that truck was there, okay? So that's what happened with the flash crash. We were one of the last buyers of puts before the market collapsed. So, but we do that for a living, okay? So you don't look at the buyers of puts, you look at the structure of the market capable of collapsing under the weight of, uh, of uh, selling, which means that the market is fragile. That's, that's the idea. So did I answer your question or no? All right, so sorry. That, that my metaphor is when, you have, uh, when the bridge collapses, you, uh, the first phone call should be to the engineer, and, so, you know, and of course, angry phone call. You don't call the, last, the owner of the last truck that was on it, OK? That's, that was my, my, that's my idea. So, plus, so I deny, plus, but it's very nice to portray me as a Professor Moriarty, okay, extremely enigmatic, you know, living an enigmatic life, hiding in places, and having a hand in the destruction of things. It's very nice to trigger black swans. You see, the black swan author caused black swan. It, 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 but unfortunately, reality isn't as romantic as that, all right? Vastly more boring. That, that, that's, that's a good point, uh, but I disagree with the notion of tipping point. Um, he's saying that the volcano appeared to be like a tipping point. Um, I, I don't believe in that notion of tipping point. It's very good in bookstores, it's, but it's not. Uh, to me, it's an ex post idea because ahead of time, you never know what's the tipping point. You know in history books, it's like saying Sarajevo was a tipping point for the first war. Okay, So that thing, it's, it's a sort of butterf butterfly in India concept. There are a lot more butterflies than events, so you're not going to you know, study every butterfly ahead of time. And to me, uh, science is perspective, not retrospective, because we have hindsight biases. But I agree with you. The, as, some, uh, as an illustration, it's just like my story of the New York, uh, uh, having someone wants, wants to wash his hands in New York uh, in August 2003, when you have a blackout and realizes how vulnerable we are to technology. We just realize how vulnerable we are with that, with that uh, volcano uh, in Iceland. But, but there, uh, there are many more problems, particularly one coming from Iceland. So let me illustrate in, in that edition of the Black Swan my idea of what has happened over the past uh, 25 years and why uh, we're a lot more, uh, uh, I would say, a lot less fit and, and the governments uh, and universities are a lot less fit to understand what's going on than they were 25 years ago. So in other words, the world has gained in complexity while incompetence has risen a lot more. So let me go through that point very quickly. And why, uh, I have one of my tweets, all right, but I call them aphorisms because, I mean, I, 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 I put things on Twitter. I have no idea what people put there except when they send me messages. So I, I'm not into the culture of the place. Uh, so one of them is, Every 10 years, there's something called Moore's Law. Every year, computational power uh, doubles. So my, 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 uh, my aphorism was, every 10 years, collective wisdom degrades by half. 
All right, so I mean, you see where we're going. No, I, okay, let me start. 25 years ago, they invented something called the internet. You agree? And we started to have experiencing a rise in complexity from the internet. The planet get, started getting smaller. The best insight on the results of that came to me from a gentleman, uh, Nathan Mervold, who explained, who gave me, I was discussing it with him, and then he sent me that paper who got me into this notion of something called area square law, or some name like that. And it tells you the following, you have a lot more species uh, per square meter in islands than you do in continents. So in other words, the diversity decreases as your space becomes larger. And that's an effect of what I discussed in the first Black Swan, the first edition of the Black Swan, as uh, the result of globalization, is you start having more clustering. In other words, think about the scenery, not in terms of species, but in terms of languages. Now uh, you have a lot more people on a planet who speak the same lang uh, language, badly, of course, bad English, as like uh, I used to call it Citibank English, but uh, I don't want to glorify it too much by sticking to the name of Citibank. By the time, they were not bust. So the whole planet speaks bad English, you see. The whole planet reads uh, Harry Potter, whereas uh, 100 years ago you had more diversity. Okay. And you had local poets and local languages. And now the whole you know, uh, planet studies a fraud called uh, portfolio theory or stuff like that. So here you have this clustering that has increased thanks to the internet. The good, you know, if you're lucky and you have a winner take call effect and you're in California and you, your name is Sergey Brin or something, then you have a company that dominates the world, all right? And anyone would have dominated the world, it's not them. Uh, but if you're right a bestseller, and I experienced that, although in a modest way, that now everybody talks to me about Black Swans. 30, you know, everybody reads Black Swans. I see it in airports and crazy places, all right? I saw it because it sells a lot more overseas, by the way, than here, per capita, strangely. So you can sell, you can have a, a planetary phenomena like the Harry Potter read by every child on, a, you know, almost every child on a planet, or some obscenely large number. So we had the rise of that complexity exacerbated by globalization and the internet. Now things run very smoothly under these conditions, except when there's an accident. Bad things can happen. At the same time, we had a rise of <coughs> leverage. I'm not just talking about financial leverage. Financial leverage is only five times what it was in 1980, which is very dangerous. But operational leverage. People have no slack in systems. People are over-optimized. Companies are very large. So it means more fragile to contingencies, and you get squeezed. Uh, let me discuss two things. Let me discuss first the notion of operational leverage or, or operational optimization, what I call optimization. Uh, I was in Istanbul as I was riding the Black Swan, and I walked into the room, and I wanted to download the hate mail I usually get, because it's the only interesting thing, the, you know, love letters and stuff are boring, the old, you know, but hate mail, there's some diversity there. <laughs> so I wanted to download my hate mail at the time. So I go in and plug my thing. It doesn't work. I call up a receptionist. Blah, 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 blah. Okay, well, technician, all right? Oh, you're in room uh, uh, 1305. Yes, yeah, I know, yeah, no, 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 no it should be working. Okay, the guy had an Indian accent. Before I hung up, I told him, "Do you um, are there a lot of Indians in Istanbul? I couldn't understand why they import Indians, all right? He said, no, no, I'm not in Istanbul, all right? So everybody's in Bangalore, which is a lot cheaper probably, except if you have a problem in Bangalore, all right? And you don't know the consequences of, of the things, you know, percolating through the system. Okay, that's a complex system. So that's operational, uh, that's optimization. It means you don't have redundancies. You go for the, the thing. But now let me talk about financial, in a financial sense. Say I have $100 capital, and, and I have a view of the future that I'm going to, you know, I'm going to be able to earn 8% return from my great idea. I'm going to have some special diet uh, things that, people can eat before the health club and after the health club, some kind of crazy thing, and I'm going to earn 8% return, okay? With a high degree of certainty attached to my forecast. I have two options. I borrow 
against, you know, at 5%. Okay, therefore I borrow 5%, earn 8%, I'm gonna leverage myself crazy. Or if I'm skeptical, I can just not borrow. But I'm gonna have a smaller project. So if I'm, you know, if I'm successful, I'm gonna make a little bit of money, not a lot. What would, you know, someone, what would we do? When you borrow, it means that the, 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 the borrowing maps one-to-one -one with confidence you have about the future, okay? But it's a lot more efficient to borrow. Anybody who went to business school learned about borrowing, okay? So that kind of, it's more, a lot more optimal, but if you're right, if you're wrong, it's a lot worse. So of course, uh, people are gonna be encouraged to borrow. The same thing can be translated into the way you operate with your inventory and all that, okay? If you had no glitch, everything is right. If you have a glitch, well, you know, you have a shortage, you have to pay up for something and you get uh, hosed. So um, the, the problem, uh, of course, is that we had a rise of that coupled with the rise of complexity. And of course, what can happen, the volcano is nothing, is what happened in 2007. Uh, things started unraveling and of course, the thing needs to collapse. But that's part one. Part two of the story is that nobody in Washington seems to know. That's the problem. Nobody seems to understand the cause of the problem is the rise of complexity, degradation of predictability, hence you have to have a system, a system a lot more robust. So in my paper, in, in my edition, I, I also, okay, let me tell you one thing. When, when I came up with the black swan, a lot of academics thought I was an idiot, all right? because it was unrigorous and sold a lot of books. When you sell a lot of books, you automatically it correlates to being an idiot. So I, then I started publishing things that I had been writing for 20 years in journals, referee journals, and they started to shut up, okay? They stopped addressing it. I started addressing things on limits of computational probability, things on, on stuff like that. But among the things I published is one thing on size, why size, causes nonlinearities, okay? The same thing can be uh, uh, extended to specialization. Anybody who learns about specialization doesn't understand anything about risk because specialization causes you to be a lot more fragile. You know, you have this theory. I don't know how many of you went to economics school. How many of you studied that ugly thing? All right. So you studied about Ricardo that it's more efficient comparative advantage for one country to produce cloth, the other wine, all right, which is great. But that model, if you perturbate, in other words, say they're going to have a fatwa against wine, all right? In America, the, the, you know, that uh, will have a new president and the president will have a fatwa against wine. What happens to your specialization or right? the optimality of the specialization, all right? So it makes you less robust to changes in environment. And, and Mother Nature is vastly smarter than, than, you know, economists visibly and than biologists, just like the economy is smarter than economists. So, Organically, things develop in a way to be robust. They face stressors and they become robust. And we humans have been messing up this, this thing with utopias, whether physical utopia or economic utopias or anything else. Just like economically, we go bail companies, we make them less robust and make society less robust. Physically, we take antibiotics, so therefore we're gonna be less robust to the next epidemic, okay? We're fragilizing ourselves. We have air conditioning all the time, so it fragilizes your system because you can experience uh, thermal gyrations which, for which we're made and, and stuff like that. So uh, uh, my concern is uh, how to increase robustness in society and what these models you study at school do to that robustness. And in fact, almost everything in economics makes you more fragile whether the tools you study uh, in, in statistics, because everything's based on a bell curve, but I'm not gonna go through that, I'm tired of the concept, this. Uh, or the other ones. Now, next. The thing that is shocking to me is, and, and that's my new work, part of my new work, isn't so much whether something is right or wrong. It's the fact that how come something can be deemed as wrong by individuals can be, uh, and, and considered as true by co the collective, okay? If you take a cab driver, a cab driver knows that you can forecast, okay? That you have to have a buffer, 
But if you collectively put people together, they start believing in the stock market, all kind of uh, lunacies, okay? And, and all kind of stuff. This is what shocks me about, about, about it. So, so Fat Tony has a saying, it's easier to scam people with billions than scam them with thousands. And it's a lot easier to fool the multitude than fool a single person. And we know from social epistemology, from contagions, from uh, something called uh, uh, informational cascades, that this is entirely true. So you have here, you've had over the past 30 years, a clustering of opinion in academia. And it, everything's dominated by, it's like almost the same economist, who's wrong, by the way. So, and you supply them with the truth, it's like your statistical method don't work in the tails. Hence, robustness, you can't compute these risks because they're uncomputable. <laughs> you supply them with the fact that you can't forecast, don't let people be suckers by relying on a forecast error. You supply them with all these facts and guess what you get? Nothing. But this is well known in medicine and in medicine it bears a name translational gap. Like it took 200 years for doctors to shed, to stop killing patients. Because if you have pneumonia, you multiply your chance of death by four if you're bled. You know, you know, and bleeding was a standard procedure. They bled you first and then started the conversation. That was, uh, and no doctor wanted to do anything that other doctors didn't do, but, and they knew they were killing patients individually, you see, but that was the profession. It's the same thing in economics, same thing in forecasting. The IMF never got anything right. The last time I had a, a nervous, uh, not nervous, I had a uh, anger fit, was number two of the IMF some schmuck called uh, Dr. Cato. I'm on a record here, so. So, uh, now anything I say about public affairs and private is public. That's my, uh, my uh, ethic. Uh, professor, uh, Mr. Cato was in Korea presenting the poor Korean, 2,500 people in the room, with the forecast by the IMF for 2010, 11, 12, 13, and 14, okay? And, and my, uh, my rage came from the fact that Mr. Cato, show him your forecasts for 2007 and 8 and 9, made in 2001, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. Had you done that, you'd realize that, that it's totally unreliable. But guess what? He's made to forecast. That's their business. All right? He's not going to stop. A crisis is not going to be, you know, say, oh, what's a crisis, all right? Just like, what's the death of a million patients, right? to stop them from their methods. That's the problem, stickiness. It's called institutional stickiness. Mother Nature doesn't do that, that this way. Mother Nature kills. It doesn't have tenure. So it acts by destroying, not by teaching or preaching, all right? So, and, and what I, when, when I did my model of a perfect society, it would be something in which people like that would be destroyed naturally, organically. Now, so institutions keep things around, okay? So, the, the, and the problem is, of course, I had these poor 2,500 suckers taking notes on his forecasts, okay, thinking they're real. And now we are suckers because we have Obama with his Office of Management and Budget. Have you heard of that? Okay, all right. How much they forecast, does someone work for him here? Okay, how much do they forecast deficit for next 10 years? How much? That, that's their forecast. The forecast, it will start with five and seven trillion, okay, 10 trillion. Take the, these guys, the same environment in Washington was forecasting oil prices 25 years down the road at $25 a barrel in January 2004, and then had to double their forecast six months later for 25 and didn't tell anybody, look, we cannot go to forecasting oil prices, all right? The same people asked them what the forecast was for a deficit made in 2007, okay? So a small little change in assumption, say higher interest rate and renewing the debt, can make that number go to 40, 50, 60 trillion. You don't realize that. People don't realize that. Okay? So my idea of a society, I have a, and I put it in, in the addition to the black swan, is I have a perfect society that would be robust. You have to have no debt. Less debt than we did in 1980. You can't function because the environment is less forecastable. But now, how many individuals follow that policy, all right, by having cash in the bank? You shoot for, I, I sh every person, uh, I'm sure, shoots for a positive uh, balances and others for uh, uh, surplus. And you end up sometimes with a deficit because of uh, unforeseen circumstances, okay? Now, why the fuck does it, sorry, I have to be, does the government shoot for deficit, okay? 
That's I don't understand. Okay. The other thing uh, uh, that 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 is uh, shocking here is the irresponsibility of making future generations pay for your mistakes. Future generations are paying for your mistakes. Whether you're polluting today, you're polluting. We don't understand the climate, by the way. So people pollute, and then later on, some schmuck is going to come up with a model, say, oh yeah, this product is bad. It's ex ante, we should know, that mother, that, that, that mother Nature knows a lot more than climate experts. Okay, And just like the human body knows a lot more than doctors. And the economy, I mean, organically knows more than, than, than economists. Uh, provided you leave it in its own habitat, so we have a uh, we have a severe expert problem, and my my platform is for society in which these experts can be frauds all they want, because they are. I mean, there, I see no difference between Mr. Cato and you paying you know his salary. Whether you're uh, from Tanzania or Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia, or U.S., you pay his salary. He's an international civil servant, so you pay. I don't know, maybe two dollars because he's very rich. He looks rich, or two cents for you. Go to his salary, all right? Okay. So you're paying the salary of, of, of someone destroying the planet. You get the idea? So we have, but there's no difference between them and astrologers. So how can experts? So this is my real concern: is how can you have pseudo experts last so long? I thought about it. I said, well, you know what? You cannot stop people from being charlatans. What you, you can't stop, just like you can't stop markets from having collective uh, uh, euphorias, whatever they want. What you can do, it's very easy, is build a system in which people can make all the mistakes they want without endangering others. And it's so simple, that blueprint is so simple. Collapse the debt, no too big to fail, no government saving Citibank, okay? No stop loss for Goldman Sachs on the part of you guys. If they lose money, we're stuck with the bill. If they make money, then they're, they're arrogant people and stuff like that. It has, it has uh, so 10 points for a black swan robust society, and it's in a book. So I'm bored with this. Let's move on to more interesting <laughs> questions. Right. He, he, that, that's a very good question. There's a gentleman in Boston, and never had the privilege of meeting, but who has the best uh, understanding of this. Uh, Orlov, is he here or is not here? Okay. Sorry? Dmitry Orlov? He, uh, he uh, you know, considers the, uh, the robustness to social breakdown. He didn't, doesn't phrase it this way, but uh, I realized he did great work. Too late, you know, I don't have mention of his work in my book, but I discovered it too late. But uh, uh, Orlov uh, explained the following. Uh, the U.S. is built around suburbia, okay? Your friends are usually friends on Facebook. Russia had turmoil, but Russia... Your friends live in the same building, and, and three people live through three generations. And even to have an activity that males and females like to do usually in private, they couldn't find the privacy. Be, uh, so they do it in stairways or stuff like that. So to tell you how, there are two things that helped Russia, an extremely bad housing uh, policy, which means people have been stuck knowing each other for, for three generations, all right? So you help each other in times of trouble. There's a liability of things, you know, it's not strangers. And the second thing is uh, what Orlov said, that one cal uh, in Russia, it uh, Stalin tried to optimize agriculture and failed. And you know he had to kill a lot of millions of farmers. That was his war. I mean, from the kulaks, that was a war of the state against farmers. So every, it's so inefficient that around every city you have all kinds of products there to support the city. In America, we pay nine calories of uh, fuel for every calorie consumed. It's too optimized. So in a breakdown, we're more vulnerable than Russia, for example, places that are less optimal. Okay. Uh, the perfect place would be Syria. They don't even know there was a crisis. They have no debt. Nobody would lend them, you see. <laughs> so, so, and, and they have good food and, and, and nice mountains and stuff. So you, you have to imagine what would happen. Yes, I, I, I think, uh, to me, I saw the war in Lebanon, and I saw how you can hit chaos rather quickly. But in, in, in Lebanon, uh, the breakdown of social order was, was slowed down by... <laughs> This familiarity with faces you see every day, so you had that uh, 
tribal uh, help. So nobody really, I mean, few people starved, if any, during the war. Whereas here, your friends on Facebook aren't going to have the emotional uh, drive to go support you. You know, it's just drop you or something, or stop checking their mail. You see, stop checking their, uh, their thing. So uh, it's a different structure. Suburbia is not good. So there may be, in case we're driven to break down social order, I think that uh, some countries are more robust than others. So if you have Russian ancestry, I would suggest you you know you know where to go. I'm going to back Lebanon, all right. So it's simple because they've had problems before, uh, and some places are more robust than others. Now, second second thing is there a high risk of breakdown of social order? Let me tell you what people don't seem to understand. I was in Athens just by complete coincidence a year and a half ago, not this time, a year and a half ago when they started rioting. And they were writing, and it reminded me of my childhood, but I was arrested at the age of 15, uh, 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 throwing a slab of stone at the policeman, okay? And I was rioting, but it looks like, I mean, I found the cause later, I don't want to riot. It was so exciting to riot with your friends, okay? And, and, and of course, I was arrested, and it caused some problems with my family because, uh, for, for a lot of reasons, so I had to be punished more than others because my grandfather was minister of... Um, the interior who sent the troops, okay? So it was simple. So when his grandson's arrested, you can't really, you have to spend more time in jail, all right? And stuff, so it was, it was great, but it was exhilarating to riot, okay? So when I was in Athens a year and a half ago, I saw these people rioting, the kids were rioting for, to riot, and it was so exhilarating, just like May 68, just like California in 1968, but May 1968 in France was prime thing, all right? Where they would go burn cars or whatever, you have this utopian drive from within to just riot, okay? And, and you feel alive and it's so wonderful. And it was arrested, it's ecstatic to be arrested, because my friends will know, <laughs> you see? You beca I became a local hero, you know, as, you know, I, I was 15, 16, and, and then suddenly you can get the dates that a 20-year-old can get because you were arrested. So this, to me, tells us where we're heading, okay? With uh, uh, generations have been deprived of any heroism, hero, you know, uh, spirit, suddenly rediscovering it. So now we saw again what happened in Greece. But there is something more vicious. The only way we can pull out of the problem, two years ago, nobody identified the problem, had one solution, collapse debt. Okay, of course I was saying it, but uh, I'm tired of the old told you so, all right? So but let's move on. But, but nobody, you know, nobody saw it then, two years ago. The, now they're seeing what needs to be done, belt tightening, because it looks like people read some things called Keynes. Keynes was smart, but they're usually uh, Keynesian or fraudsters because they don't quite understand that the whole notion doesn't work on the high uncertainty. So whatever equation you're using, my, I'm trained to perturbate stuff. Okay, so if you perturbate Keynesian policies under uncertainty, the thing blows up, okay? But visibly, you're borrowing money you don't have now. Everybody's borrowing money that they don't have, okay? Now, the 10 trillion, who are you gonna borrow for? Oh, the Chinese, the Chinese have two trillion, okay? Two trillion, all right? Who are you gonna now they're borrowing from you, from people putting the money in treasury bills, but these people are dying, all right? Or, or running out of money. So we have a problem with uh, with uh, what needs to be done. What needs to be done, of course, you're going to ask people to tighten their belt. But look what's going to happen. Take Greece. They're going to riot, and everywhere in Europe they're going to riot, because the kids are going to say, why should I pay the price for mistakes made by those bankers? So they're going to go burn, uh, I don't know if you own a Rolls Royce, I wouldn't own one. Okay, you try to have a none. uh the script car, if you can. That's what I suggest, you see, and things like that. So I, I suggest that uh, to lay low, okay, have uh, gold in your basement and stuff like that, and go to Siberia if you have friends over there or something like that. But I mean, the, the, you can have easily, I, I, I mean, hopefully we won't have that problem, but if we have a social breakdown today, the world is more fragile. So that volcano is nothing, it's peanuts. What, what, what can happen, the internet, we don't understand the internet. Uh, Pakistan shut down YouTube one day, YouTube worldwide went down. We don't quite understand with these, all these interactions what can happen. 
one place or the other. So um, uh, Greece is a small thing. It's 2% of 2.5% of the European Union, which is nothing. But <coughs> so I can expect here to have social disorder. It's so simple. The youth would say, look, we're paying the price for bankers. It's outrageous. And then go after, hopefully, beat up Larry Summers. Uh, no, 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 I didn't say it, all right? <laughs> but uh, beat up uh, uh, Bob Rubin. Bob Rubin, I mean, sorry. Uh, or something like that. S stuff that, 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 that kids like to do. And, and from there, it may degenerate. Now, what is a society that's robust to that? It's a society that very quickly recognizes, all right, and start punishing. In other words, the Obama, instead of favoring Goldman Sachs guys and stuff like that, you go in and start punishing to show that he means business and immediately start tightening all right, the belts by saying, we adults, adult, some idiot lent to another idiot. There's no reason why I should transfer, uh, socialize those losses. Those who made the mistake should pay but they're too scared of the consequences themselves. The only person who seems to be aware of the problem today is David Cameron in the UK. Yes, we have a question in the back. Uh, is there any predictive meta-analysis that is feasible? Is it possible to come up with metrics to, to evaluate the robustness of the system beforehand? Uh, well, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I'm sure there is, but uh, I, I go rule, I mean, I'm just, I'm not, my specialty is not robustness. It's just, I came to it, okay? My specialty is the inverse of robustness. But I came up with seven or eight methods, not meta, seven or eight methods, and I'll give you for, for portfolio robustness, and I can generalize, okay? You start playing with the parameters, okay? Take value at risk or a method like that. You start playing with the parameters and see, or, or the, the, the you, just by perturbating the parameters, how much the output changes. And that gives you an indicator how robust you are to value at risk. And this is how I came up to with my barbell strategy, because if you perturbate, if you have 75% cash, uh, value at risk tells you the, prob the, the probabilistically assessed risk of losing more than 15%, no, no method will make you, will show you, will show any difference. So that's ultimate rob robustness. And uh, this is what I mean, per perturbation of parameters and also change of class, uh, <coughs> change of, class of distribution, thin tail, fat tail, and stuff like that. But uh, there's a general theory top down, I don't know. I, I don't know, I don't know, there can be one, I'm not spending time on this. I'm spending time on identifying fragility. Now, how to identify fragility, to me, is all linked to small probabilities. What I did is I did something called four quadrants, okay? My specialty is tales of distribution, is rare event and the role of rare event. That's my lifetime specialty. I had no other specialty. And a little bit of biography. I was a trader in 1987 with some schmuck MBA, which doesn't teach you anything. And I saw, no, I discovered in 1985 some that the tail events could matter. In 1987, I decided to become a scholar of tail events. Okay, so I had to go spend half the time in psychology, why people don't get the point, and the other half in the empiricism of tail events. Okay, and let me uh, uh, tell you what the, my discovery, reframing my black swan, is that there's some domain in which tail events play a larger role than others, type two, type one domains. And the second thing is that some exposures that are larger to tail events than others, okay? So you don't have, the, 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 to answer the, 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 the first, the previous question. So here, for example, let me give you an idea, okay? If I'm uh, 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 operating on a patient, okay? Either I kill him or I don't kill him. I'm a doctor, okay? But it's not like I'm going to kill him 10 times, you right? You kill him once. So the outcome is very binary. It's in, it doesn't, it's not impacted by tail events. On the other hand, an epidemic can be impacted by tail events. An epidemic can kill 100 people or a billion people, or, or maybe 6 billion people, you see? So a war can kill a lot of people. In a, a bet with a friend of a dollar, okay, regardless of, of the distribution, is, is limited to, is in, doesn't, uh, is insensitive to fat tails. So I had my three quadrants, decisions that are sensitive to fat tails, decisions that are not sensitive to fat tails, 
and then up top I had distribution that have fat tails, distribution that don't have fat tails. Sorry to get technical, but this. And then there's fourth quadrant of exposure to fat tails and distribution that have fat tail. And my idea is get the fuck out of there, all right? <laughs> However you can. That, that was the point, all right? So, sorry for, uh, is it, uh, you have to clip, all right? For, okay. So uh, we're not allowed to curse on TV. Is it live or not live? It's not live, okay. So no, that's what they tell me every time I go to the studio, all right? The, uh, so get out of there, okay? So simple. So how do you get out of there? My friend Terry here runs a portfolio. He just goes into cash. Cash is insensitive to probability distribution. It doesn't vary because your neural error is cash, all right? I'm from Lebanon, so my neural error is gold, all right? So whatever I have in gold is insensitive to distribution, stuff like that. Now, can you hedge everything that way? No, I cannot hedge the risk of epidemics. I can, why I can't hedge the risk of epidemics? I can't, unless you stop airplanes from flying. Okay, because if airplanes transport people, venereal diseases and other uh, stuff like that, very inconvenient things. So you can't, you know, uh, you cannot, so epidemics travel now much faster than they did before. And of course, the, the, they're fatter tail than before because the whole planet now is connected. Stuff, so that my idea is how to get out of the fourth quadrant. And finance is simple, very, very simple. In economic life, it's very simple to get out of the fourth quadrant. Okay, no too big to fail, no big impact. And the metaphor I say is, look at Mother Nature. The elephant, if I shot an elephant, no impact on ecosystem. If you shoot Goldman Sachs, God forbid, no, actually, I hope. Okay, <laughs> someone shot Goldman Sachs, it'd be a big impact on the ecosystem, you see. So Goldman Sachs is too big. Hedge funds are okay, because if you shot, shoot, shot a hedge fund, no impact on the ecosystem. That's sort of like parameters, and finance is very simple. Outside finance, I don't know, all right? I, I, I had a few speculative ideas. Now, do we need to measure with parameters? I don't know, but there's a trick I used in the past about sensitivity to parametric uh, or distributional uh, changes uh, that, that gives you uh, some idea. Yeah, okay, she's asking about public policy preventing too big to fail. Let me uh, tell you what we'd like to do. Um, the governments are the ones who, well, the government regulation is not the panacea because regulation tends to make Goldman Sachs rich. The registrators, I mean, my colleague got rich because regulation, all right? You find some uh, expensive lawyer and you go around it, and of course it makes lawyers rich. So the, uh, the, I bet some regulation can work. I'm not against, but don't think it's a panacea. Regulation is what got us here. We had regulation, they're regulating, uh, like they say, oh, the firms have, the bank can use this model to measure tail events. That was plain bullshit. I knew that, I spent 12 years saying it was plain bullshit. And of course, they were kept using it called value at risk. And of course they blew up. And they still use it today, by the way. And regulations allowed people to say, oh, you can own AAA paper. So you had some trader put them, give them garbage and find ways to call it AAA. So, okay. And here you're asking me, your question is if uh, government can stop too big to fail. You don't have to. You, all you have to do is remove the advantage given to the big guy or stop favoring the big guy. In 1982, had you let Citibank go bust, we wouldn't have Lehman Brothers today. You should let him die and go to the funeral, okay? That, that's the way to do it, okay? We bailed out Detroit. I don't know if you remember Chrysler. We bailed them out. We started bailing them out, and they get, keep getting bigger. We've been bailing. They're just the idea of bailing out a company. And, of course, when we bailed out in 1982, uh, the, all these uh, schmucks, guess what they said? It's so un-American. We'll never do it again. When you someone say we'll never do it again, it's a confirmation of the guarantee that they'll do it again, right? <laughs> like someone saying never again, in one of my aphorisms, uh, you're guaranteed repetition, right? So, and of course, if you bail out someone, he knows it's just like a, a kid, you know, you let him off, then they know they can push the envelope a little more. So just not bailing out is already good, good, good enough. But let me tell you other things. I've been talking to the current administration about why is it that hairdressers, for example, uh, and massage professionals and uh, small grocery store owners, okay, are never bailed out, okay? But this, that system is very robust. They have a huge disadvantage to the big guy. 
I was at uh, the public library with uh, uh, arguing with Niall Ferguson from Harvard, and there was that poor lady, the chairperson of uh, PepsiCo, and, and she didn't know what she was getting into, okay, <laughs> sitting between the two of us. Her argument, she used, she made a mistake, she was the argument, I employ 300,000 people, so therefore she should have a say. You see how dangerous it is? These people, and Ferguson, of course, who knows his history, immediately picked up on the fact that that was in Marx and Engels, okay? Whether you're libertarian or a communist, you know you're going to have collusion between state and large companies, and that's Europe, okay? Collusion and large companies are, are like just an integrant part of the state, okay? And, of course, the state appears to be smaller, but they have all these satellites around them, okay? So I looked at her, we looked at her, and then, of course, we, you know, you realize this is a company that deserves to go bust because they're hijacking the state. I employ 300,000 people, okay? Whereas, individually, grocery store owners, hairdressers, prostitutes, massage professionals, uh, all these poor people, okay, they're not bailed out, okay? So you, you see the, the uh, restaurant owners, okay? So you, you, you get the idea of what the state should do. The state should stop giving advantage to the big, and the big, I guarantee, will self-destroy. Don't give someone a monopoly, but at the same time, don't bail out anyone. And look what will happen, because companies, if you look at the history of companies, they love to self-destroy themselves by getting my elephant. Uh, uh, you just let them. The minute, so that's, that's, uh, that's all you have to do. Uh, are we done? Great. Thank you. Thanks a lot for listening. <laughs>